Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Cleveland with Temple University, Japan's ICAST through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. I'm here today with Troy Duster. Troy is an eminent sociologist who is now a professor emeritus at University of California, Berkeley, where he taught for some 40 years. Troy is a former president of the American Sociological Association, a notable scholar whose work was really groundbreaking on some of the issues that he was addressing and also has just lived through a, a really amazing experience and has a deep knowledge of issues related to civil rights. Troy, thanks so much for joining us today. Glad to join you. So, Troy, if you could maybe give a little bit of a brief self-introduction. Um, we were talking earlier about how you had made the trip from Chicago going through Route 66 to the West Coast this would have been back in the 1950s? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different world than it was today, but can you talk about those experiences? Sure, well, let, let me give a little background before we get to the trip across the country. Uh, I grew up in Chicago on the near south side, and as reported in a book called American Apartheid, Chicago, along with many major cities, was extraordinarily segregated by race. So there would be a black part of town where there'd be almost no others besides blacks. Um, and I grew up um, in this area. I went to a high school called Wendell Phillips. There were over 2,000 students. However, um, only one of those 2,000 students was not an African American. His name was Frank Wong. And his father owned the Chinese restaurant on Cermak Road. So that gives you a sense of the extraordinary apartheid-like features of living in a big city like Chicago in the 1950s. Um, it's an extraordinary thing because one comes up to think that that's the way the world is naturally. That is, it's not as though this is seen as something unusual. Mm -hmm. It's just the way things are. And we'll get to the policing issue later, but throughout my youth, um, the, mainly the people we saw who were white coming through the area were the police. Um, there were an, an occasional store owners on 31st Street who were white, but uh, they had mainly black employees. And so, yes, it was, it was an apartheid-like setting. Surveillance cameras everywhere, helicopters flying over with spotlights, a really invasive and quite obvious uh, police cruising through that area. And I had a kind of epiphany that this was like a minimum security prison with the bus yeah. service to downtown. It, it yeah. really did have a sense of a, a controlled police state in that largely African-American neighborhood. Yeah, and there, was some, there were some studies that were done by the National Opinion Research Council, NORC, 1942. They did studies of attitudes of white Americans towards race relations, and what they meant was attitudes towards blacks. And two of the findings which I think are interesting from that period, half the white population thought that there was no need for there to be any integration of public accommodations like restaurants or bowling alleys or hotels. Um, mm -hmm. And something like two thirds of the white population was not in favor of integration of the schools. So this apartheid-like feature of the, of the North even uh, was a routine feature of the lives of blacks and whites. Uh, I finished high school and went on to college at Northwestern University, um, where I was one of seven black students on a campus of about 7,200. And I would occasionally be asked what position I played because almost all of the black males on the campus were either football or basketball players. And I had one of these, uh, F, it's called a scholarship academic, and so it was interesting that I would always be assumed to be an athlete. Right. Okay, I finished college and was invited to come to the University of 
California, Los Angeles, um, to graduate work in sociology. And um, that's the part of the story which you asked me to start with, which is I'm driving across the country. It's 1957. And not having been much out of Chicago or out into the world, I just assumed that when I came to a motel when I was driving across the country, I could get uh, a room. And so it was my wake up call that over and over again, I would go to a motel on the road, Route 66, and be told that uh, all the rooms were taken. No, when they room. obviously were not. Yeah. When they obviously were not. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did, I learned to sleep in my car. And somewhere in Route 66 there in a certain part of Missouri, I forget what town it was. You know, I waited for a bit, went out of, outside of town and got my pillow out and on the back seat and tried to go to sleep. There was a knock on my window. It was the police, Howie Patrol. And they said, you can't sleep here. I said, I told my story. I said, I tried three motels and each one had refused me. And they said, well, we're sorry, but you just, it's, it's against the law. You, you, you cannot sleep here. So there I was at maybe three in the morning, uh, having to get back on the road and drive to another place where of course I did pull over to the side of the road and, and got some sleep. So that's sort of the introduction to my um, move out into the exterior world of Chicago uh, and Northwestern. I was, uh, I was getting a lesson in race relations uh, up close and firsthand. It's ironic that in a book that's been written about you, I think the author designates that town as Joplin, Missouri. Whereas it's quite, quite possible, yes. And I grew up in that immediate area. And I, as we were talking earlier, that was an era of sundown towns. James Lowen has written a book by that title. Yes. Towns in which were racially exclusive and many of these were dominated by, if not directly by white supremacy groups, then by an ideology that enforced that. And, and those sundown laws were all over the country. I mentioned that uh, when I got to UCLA, I learned that the city of Bel Air still had a sundown law in the late 1960s. And I've heard from colleagues and friends from around the country similar stories where whether it was Eugene, Oregon, or up in Seattle, th there were sundown laws that said no blacks could be in town after the sun went down. That's amazing. Well, James Lowen writing about this had identified what he thought was about 2,000 towns, largely on the periphery of the former southern states. A lot of this was in the Midwest, and towns which were entirely racially exclusive, but my impression was that that was, if not in the South and in the, in the Midwest on the periphery of the former slave states. But you're saying this is on the West Coast and all throughout yeah, the United definitely. States. Definitely. It was all over the country. Yeah, these, these were very, very common uh, experiences of black colleagues of mine who would tell me stories about, yeah, when the sun went down, you had to be out of town. It's yeah. remarkable. Well, I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves because I think we'll loop back to this a little later, but obviously that control of public space and that history has some deep connection to what we've seen with the the police brutality and the kind of pervasive invasive surveillance that you see by police across the the largest urban spaces as well today right i mean the question was always to be raised what are you doing in this part of town mm -hmm. when i was a student at northwestern again a town of a, so several thousand uh, eight or 10,000 students, maybe another 15, 20,000 residents, um, I would be stopped occasionally on my way to class. Um, I'd be asked by the local police, what are you doing here? And I would tell them I was a student. But there were some amusing moments in which, you know, I was teaching, I was taking a course in philosophy and one of the cops asked me, well, what are you studying? So I decided to be a kind of a smart ass. I said, moral philosophy, uh, Nietzsche and so on. Uh -huh. um, and he seemed to be interested and amused and a few months went by. And then one evening I'm walking home from one of my classes 
and the police car rolls up and once again the cop jumps out and says um, what are you doing here and i said i'm a student at, North, at the university and the other guy behind the wheel said oh yeah he's okay he's in the moral philosophy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know Joseph Groves, I guess, because he's written in a field that that you've written in as well. And he talk, he's African-American, and he talks about walking across his own campus, and he'll be stopped. Or they'll ask him what coach, you know, what team he coaches. <laughs> right. right. It's amazing. Right. So yeah. I imagine by the time you get to the West Coast, this would have been the late 50s? 1957. So this was just at... A, a kind of a pivot point in the civil rights era at that time. Yes. So how did you see that develop in real time? And I think particularly the West Coast and Berkeley where you ended up were, were very important sites for the development of the modern civil rights movement. Well, yes and no. I mean, one of the features of my experience at UCLA was very much like Chicago. Namely, I attempted to get an apartment near the college, which is in Westwood. Mm -hmm. And uh, for several weeks, I kept running up against this barrier that, uh, no, we just don't have room, even though it, there was a big for rent sign out. And finally, one day, uh, I came across this situation, which seemed to be ideal. And the owner interviewed me. There was an apartment above a garage a one bedroom apartment and it was not in Westwood, but it was nearby. And um, he said that he, he, he liked me, he thought that I was probably going to be a good tenant. And he personally thought it was a good idea, but he wanted to talk to his you know, family and get back to me. So about a week later, he called me and said uh, he was very sorry, but that he himself would have liked for me to be a tenant, but that he and his family just, they decided, no, it wasn't a good idea. So even though we're at the beginning of the awakening in the late 1950s of the nature and character of social movements around race, um, it was a feature of everyone's life that this long history of housing, housing practices around the country, Los Angeles even, uh, where there were not that many blacks, was still an apartheid-like circumstance. So it's difficult not to be a prisoner of the moment when we see such terrible scenes in, in the urban cities of the United States. But this has been compelled largely by the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, not just after the death of George Floyd, but in years previous to that. And from my vantage point, I'm a little bit younger than you, this seems to be an unprecedented moment in modern American race relations. And yet you were at UC Berkeley in the 1960s. Yes. So how do you see this in terms of, how would you contextualize the current Black Lives Matter movement in light of that experience that you lived through between the 50s going into the 1960s? Well, of course, the 1960s were pivotal. Uh, not because there was a break in what I've called the apartheid-like circumstances of housing and public accommodations. Uh, even Berkeley in the 1950s had a restriction on who could swim in the pool and blacks could not. That's, that's Berkeley in the 1950s and early 60s. Um, what's different, of course, is that there was a movement in, in Berkeley started in Berkeley, the free speech movement. And that movement actually came out of resistance in the South. That is, Mario Savio and many of the students had gone to the South in 1960 1964 to engage in a attempt to get Blacks to vote. It was voter registration, 1963 64 And when they came back to Berkeley, many of the Blacks who were in town here said, well, wait a minute, there are issues here in Berkeley that there are no way, that there's no way that um, blacks can be hired at the Safeway grocery store, for example. Um, and so the students mobilized, free speech movement mobilized in part around free speech, around racial integration. And that story is not very well understood. It was seen as a free speech movement, 
what I think has been lost is that it was free speech to organize on campus. And at the time, the owner of the Oakland Tribune, a guy named Nolan, called the regents of the University of California. He called the president and he said, we have to stop this mobilization at the Berkeley campus. And the, the background, of course, to the story is um, that this ignited a whole movement around, quote, free speech. But again, the, con the contextual circumstances were the fact that blacks were unable to gain employment in nearby stores or uh, what's called auto row, where people would, of course, be buying cars. So it was, uh, from the very beginning, it was tied up to the issues of racial integration. By the 19, this is interesting because um, Berkeley is known to be a radical place, but it was radical primarily with respect to how the faculty saw things outside, not inside the campus. Um, so there were all kinds of problems with respect to students and housing issues or on campus. Um, the faculty was okay with some of that, but when it came to the integration of the various programs, that either faculty or students, the faculty was not that interested in, this was before affirmative action, of course, they were not interested in, uh, shall we call it, um, championing racial integration. Yes, for voter registration in the South, they were in favor of that. But when it came home to no, their own backyard, yeah. right, they became uh, often quite, quite conservative. And um, several people who were quite liberal in terms of their politics um, objected to the free speech movement um, and left the campus uh, because of it. Well, I find that surprisingly at a place like Berkeley, you know, the joke about Berkeley is that it's the People's Republic of Berkeley. And eventually, I suppose it got to that. But was that debate and movement on free, on freedom of speech, and is that something that morphed into and started to attach itself to the emerging civil rights movement in the 60s? Well, the context here is everything, because Berkeley is next door to Oakland. And Oakland was the seat of the emergence of the Black Panther Party with Huey Newton and Robbie right. Steele and Eldridge Cleaver. So right next door, there was this mobilization of the Black Panther movement. And these three, in particular, uh, uh, Eldridge Cleaver and uh, Bobby Seale, would come to campus to speak. And they would get the students riled up and mobilized to go back into Oakland. Now, remember, this is also the period of the Vietnam War. And so these movements are colliding, merging, and it's, it's difficult to pull them apart. But the anti-war movement, the uh, Black Panthers, uh, mobilization around sickle cell anemia and uh, programs for uh, feeding children, all of these things were coming together. Um, and as, as you know, the Black Panthers became pivotal in the emergence of a more radical development called the Black Power Movement. So in the middle 1960s, it was still civil rights. Um, but what happened around 1967, 68, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, the Black Panthers and um, another, other groups sort of coalesced around Black Power. Um, and everything changed after that. Everything changed. The, the movement split. Many white liberals were, quote, pushed out of the movement's leadership roles. And um, we, we found ourselves in a circumstance where uh, there was not much room for the integration of scholars, for uh, uh, students found themselves in a, in a situation where they were often criticized if they were eating at lunch tables with whites and so on. So this, this issue of black power and black insurgency and black, black mobilization really struck home, even at a place like Berkeley, by the late 1960s, early 1970s. So the changes that you were experiencing and witness to in the 1960s in Berkeley, these all have a historical context and a root. 
your grandmother was a historic figure in the civil rights movement, Ida B. Wells, who was a journalist and educator and one of the founders of the NAACP. Now, although she had died by the time that you were born, you have a connection to her through your mother. And I wonder if you could speak about to what extent there was a continuity between the, the priorities and the development of the NAACP and the era in which your grandmother was living and then the rise of black nationalism in the 60s as you were at Berkeley? Well, um, the, I guess I, I would begin with what happened with my grandmother's er, early experiences with racial discrimination. She happened to grow up in the period of Reconstruction. So right after the Civil War, there was a period of about 10 to 12 years in which my grandmother um, grew up. She was born into slavery, but slavery ended when she was two years old. So she grew up in a family in which um, there was some remarkable hope about the transformation of American society. Reconstruction um, was a period in which blacks began to vote. Um, they had their own schools. They actually were elected to members of the, the Congress. Um, and there was actually legitimate black power in the South. Now that 12 year period ended of course, when the North pulled out the troops and the um, Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacists and so forth, uh, be, regained power and then began a crushing period of Jim Crow legislation, which blacks were then unable to vote. Now, this is relevant to my grandmother because she grew up in this period of ascendancy and hope. Uh, right around the corner, there would be this liberation uh, her father was the son of the slave owner. Um, her, her father was actually born into slavery and lived as a slave, but being the son of the slave owner, he got a special treatment. He was trained as a carpenter. And um, so he had a fairly good life after slavery ended. My grandmother, therefore, grows up. She is she learns, she gets educated. Um, and then at about age 16, there's a yellow fever that strikes and the whole family is de de decimated. However, my grandmother, again, believes that right around the corner, there will be a better day of freedom. And so this is the beginning of her transformation into an activist. Um, and the story is now well told about how she is on a train between Memphis and uh, some place in the north, and uh, she's t she's um, told she's in the wrong section. And the, the motorman uh, comes off and asks for her ticket, and then says she's in the wrong section. She has to leave that part of the all white upper class segment. Now, because of that history I just told you, my grandmother is very angry, and she's says no, she's not leaving. And when he tries to forcefully take her off the, out of that part of the train, um, she actually bites him. <laughs> so he goes and gets another two or three and they come and they literally throw her off the train. What, what year would this have been? It would be about, let's see, what, 16, it's about 19, about 1889, probably somewhere in there. Wow. Maybe 1888. Um, again, given her training, she files a lawsuit. She and she wins. She takes it. Uh, uh, the, the courts give her damages of five hundred dollars, and um, she's triumphant. But then there's an appeal, and the higher court strikes it down. Now that's the part one of the two-part story of my grandmother and how she is going to become much more active and a radical. The second part of the story is um, she starts writing about her experiences and she becomes a journalist mm -hmm. and she co-owns a, a press in, in, uh, in Memphis. Um, and again, this part of the story is now well known, but I'll give it a quick summary here because it's relevant to what's going to happen when she gets to the North. Um, there were 
three of her close friends who co-owned a grocery store for mainly black patrons. And they were quite successful. Um, and their economic success was a threat to the, the whites in the area. And so they, there was some developing mythological charge that they had in, insulted some white people. And they were therefore the subject of this mob that came, took them out and lynched them. Okay, this is the beginning of my grandmother's investigative reporting. And this is what turns her career. She, met, he, she starts to write then about how lynching is not really about what people have said. It's not about rape. It's about competition. It's about black people gaining a foothold in the economy. And that's how and why she becomes an important figure when she is, when her press is burned down, her life is threatened. She moves to the North. She has spent some time in New York. She continues to write, and along with about three or four other people in this era, she becomes the first of a series of what could be called investigative reporters, in that she's spending a lot of her time doing research on lynching and other atrocities. And she publishes these articles, and she's then, she becomes very famous. She's called the Princess of the Black Press. And... Um, Again, her, her story then moves to Chicago where she meets and marries Ferdinand Barnett. Now Barnett, um, very light-skinned black, was a widow. But he was also well-educated. He actually went to law school at what was to become Northwestern. And the, the two of them then had four children, the last of which was my mother. But back to your question about what was going on in terms of the politics of the situation, uh, the two of them, Ferdinand Barnett and Ida B. Wells, were important figures in Chicago at the turn of the century. And what was going on was the insurgency, the notion that blacks were seen as um, unable to compete with whites. And here's the, the battle between Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. and W.B. Du Bois. And this battle is going to, of course, influence what is going to happen with my, my grandmother. She joins with W.B. Du Bois, and the two of them are very, very vigorous in fighting against the Booker T. Washington position, which was that blacks should go to trade schools and learn trades and not go to universities and try to compete with, with whites um, at Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Um, and this, this debate was, was to go on for the next uh, 20 years. Anyway, that's a, that's, that's a little abbreviated version of, of the issues. Um, she joins hands with, uh, again, Du Bois, and they, they co-found NAACP. What a remarkable woman. The, the book you're referring to, her reporting on racial violence, was entitled Southern Horrors, Lynch yes. Law in All Its Phases. And that's written in the late 1890s. Yes, I believe that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it was remarkable. There, there's been a lot of work that's been done on this, of course. So Lander Patterson has written about it, has a, a book um, titled Blood Rituals. Um, Brian Stevenson. Yeah. 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 Um, David Levering Lewis has yes. an essay in the New York Review of Books on what he calls an American pastime. And he had estimated that there were at least... 6,000 recognized lynchings throughout mm -hmm. the United States. But of course, that's, that's only a fraction. Right. Uh, and many, what I find remarkable about those is the, the public spectacle, the ritual aspects of this, the, the theatrical aspects of it, and where you have crowds of hundreds, maybe thousands of people involved in this ritual display of violence. And so well, obviously yeah. there's belligerency involved in that, but it was extraordinarily violent. You know, these people are quite literally being murdered and tortured. But you're saying that there's, this is a kind of a mechanism of control. Yes. There's no doubt in this historical hindsight that this was about terrorizing the black community. Mm -hmm. After Reconstruction, the whole purpose of the white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klan, was to prevent blacks from getting power 
to interrupt the capacity to vote and so forth, uh, it, to own businesses. Uh, you'll know that from the most recent scandals around Tulsa, that when blacks did gain some economic security and uh, there in Tulsa, um, they became the subject of almost uh, genocide. Uh, there was a, a kind of a, out of riot simply raging through Tulsa and they just destroyed the whole black yeah. community, killing over 350 people. So, so yes, um, this, is a, this is a dramatic issue with lynching. It was purposeful terror. It was purposefully designed to terrorize blacks and therefore this ritual was, people had postcards made of it um, in its most horrible manifestation. Uh, people would actually take the fingers and the thumbs of those who had been hanged uh, for souvenirs. And Leon Litvak has uh, written an extraordinary essay on this, uh, which he, he talks about how people would bring their children and bring their lunch to the lynchings. There's a short film, you can find this up on YouTube by James Allen, who collected and compiled these various postcards of lynchings. Mm -hmm. And he has a kind of voiceover commentary on it. And just how common these were, that he picked these up in flea markets around the South. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of uh, displaying these almost like trophies. Yeah. Uh, it's just the worst aspect of humanity. And, but I think one thing for young students today to, to really understand about this is that's not really in the deep past of American history. There, you know, in, in other ways and other modes, this continues today. And you know, this is the argument made by Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow that rather than the older Jim Crow of legalized segregation having somehow reached some end point as America started to become more integrated and people's attitudes started to become more accepting. In fact, there is a real clear continuity in the criminal justice system today and the way that policing is practiced, not only the control of urban space and public space, but also the police being enlisted as a, as a controlling, occupying force in these urban neighborhoods. Right. Well, let's go back to this post-Reconstruction period because it's central to what you're describing. That is, it wasn't that suddenly uh, Blacks were freed from slavery, had 12 years of freedom, and then uh, Ku Klux Klan. No. Um, there was a period after Reconstruction in which it was, quote, uh, on a, a famous book from the period, um, all but in name, it was slavery. That is, blacks would, mm -hmm. let's say, have some infraction, and the infraction would, would land them a prison term of, let's say, a couple of months. And in order to get out of the prison, they could be purposefully designated to some owner of the land who would then pay them a pittance, but keep them in this kind of indentured circumstance for a year or two. So even in, in the period post-Reconstruction, it was almost like slavery for hundreds of thousands of Black people in the South. And as you know, Blacks remained in the South until about uh, World War I. 1905, I think, is still about 85% of the Black population is in the South. Um, it doesn't begin to shift until, again, World War One, and by World War II, that, mo that mo mobilization has become re relatively common, where Blacks have now moved, at least half of them have moved out of the South. That's the work of Isabel Wilkerson in her book called The Warmth of Other Sons, where she talks about the mass migration yes. of African Americans from the South, and that anyone leaving that system of indentured servitude, no matter what kind of job they got in the urban industrial Northeast, that would have been a rise in socioeconomic status, also free of the kind of racial violence. Not that there wasn't racism in the North at that time, but it was really qualitatively different. Uh, right. William Julius Wilson writes about how in, um, you know, the, the Black Renaissance in Harlem, where you had not only the rise of jazz, but uh, Malcolm X, who had escaped the South, his father had been lynched. Mm -hmm. And he goes into the North, and people are able to live a different kind of life. But she has a new book that's getting a lot of notice called Cast, and she makes the argument 
that we really can understand these the systematic segregation and the lack of integration of minorities into you know public political institutions as being a byproduct of a caste system and she compares this to india it's relevant to japan japan itself as well had a caste system with the barakamine and um, an earlier era what would your take be on do you think that's a an accurate assessment and what would that mean well for me the issue is not accuracy or a lack of it it is that it's insightful and what I think she has done with this book is to get people to think in new ways right. about the relations between the races. Right. Now, there are scholars uh, who have committed themselves to the notion that caste is only to be understood in a system like that in India. Um, but that's a very narrow rendering of the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One can have caste-like relationships, even if it's not the caste system of India. And what I think Wilkerson has done in this, in this new book is to give people a different angle on this. I mean, is, is it not been a totally new idea? I mean, there was a book called Cast and Class in a Southern Town by John Dollar. That's right. But he was criticized roundly by analysts who had committed themselves to this academic view that there's only one caste system. And so any attempt to draw caste into the American scene was a fraught and... Uh, um, ignorant position. I, I think that that's wrong. I think one can use a concept like caste to illuminate relationships. And I think uh, Wilkerson has done a wonderful job, not just a good job, but a wonderful job in helping to reconceptualize caste-like relationships in uh, racial terms. Maybe it's kind of a paradigm shift in how the issues are framed, but as you mentioned, Dollar's book that I think was written in 1929, he doesn't identify overtly what the town was, but I think it was a small town in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, that's 1929. And so, you know, these issues are really historically deeply inscribed. Yes. Yes. So one of the aspects, as I understand it, of the caste system is the notion of a racial hierarchy of superiority and inferiority, and that that's based upon um, biologically inscribed qualities and characteristics of people, that they are born into a certain class, yes. and that they are almost different species from the people that reside in the other caste. You've done very important work in the field of sociology on the relationship between biology and race. Can you discuss that work and how that tracks onto this? Yes, well, um, for, for long periods, there's been this idea that race is biological, uh, going back to the 18th century and the earliest classifications of groups by the Swedish scientist Linnaeus. Um, he breaks the, the, the world into five racial groups. And that has been at the core of much scientific thinking for three centuries. Now, it's been transmuted, transmogrified, shifted around a bit. Um, but the idea that there are these distinctive racial categories is such a powerful idea because you can, quote, look around and see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. That is, anybody with two eyes can look around and see that there are these differences between people of different skin color, uh, different uh, epicantic fold for Asians and so forth. And so it's, it's an easy resonation that race is biological. Um, now, what happened during slavery was that this was a convenient way of explaining why blacks could and should be enslaved, that they were biologically inferior. And a good part of the middle of the 19th century, scientific literature is all about explaining why blacks are biologically inferior. There's a famous book by Cartwright uh, in which he talks about runaway slaves. And there's a term for it, it's called drapetomania. And the term is meant to say that some blacks have this disease and it's the disease to quote, run away. Um, that Can you say the name of that term again? So Drapetomania, D-R-A-P-E-T-O-M-A-N-I-A. Uh, and it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the biological literature. It was, it was published in about 1856 and of course was used to justify slavery. That, black, that blacks are, of course, 
biologically inferior. Okay, um, that that idea has deep roots, and it's not going away soon. Now, what happened in the um, the Enlightenment of the last or the middle part of the twentieth century? More and more scholars began to say, "No, no, um, race is primarily a social construction, and tracks along lines which you can." classify people based upon their appearance, but that, that is not biological. That, that's a social characterization. And so back in the 1950s, um, famous anthropologist Ashley Montague uh, wrote a piece for the United Nations in which he disseminates, he, he, he goes through great detail to show how racial categories are constructed socially and that they don't have biological meaning. All right, so that was in the 1950s. Um, 1970s, 1980s come along, and something very strange happens in terms of this story. We discover at the biological level that certain diseases are more common in some groups than others. And in particular, uh, in 1960, 61, there is the discovery that there is a, at the molecular level, at the genetic level, there's something called sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia, in the United States at least, is primarily a disease that victimizes African Americans. So this was an extraordinary and important, quote, discovery, because now we can begin to think about medications that would um, modify, mollify, mitigate the disease. But it also opened another window to what would be called something which um, I, along with another two or three of my colleagues have called the molecular reinscription of race. Now, once we began to get this idea going that there were different groups with different diseases, muscular dystrophy, um, mainly for among whites, especially people from the British Isles. Um, um, certain kinds of diseases of the blood, uh, certain kinds of hematological problems occur mainly in Asian populations as opposed to non-Asian populations. So what this did was to open up a whole new arena in the scientific world that would gain its particular manifestation in the Human Genome Project. And ironically, the Human Genome Project comes, comes up with the idea that we're 99.9% .9 all the same biologically. We only have less than 1% of our DNA across all human groups, which is different. So on the surface, it looked like the Human Genome Project was once and for all going to get rid of the idea that race is biological. Ah, uh, but here's the rub. <laughs> um, the problem here is that that 1% contains several hundred million what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. I won't get into any more detail but to say that even one particular polymorphism can change your genetic structure. You can become, for example, very unhealthy if only one gene produces, for example, hemophilia, or one gene uh, discoded right. in certain ways right. can produce um, spina bifida or sickle cell anemia, and you could go on, Tay-Sachs. So yep. at the conclusion of the Human Genome Project, the various uh, figures, the head of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collins and uh, a few others got together at the White House and declared that the project had declared once and for all there's only one race, the human race. However, waiting in the wings were these other scholars, scientists, molecular geneticists, who said, wait a minute, we can now show you that the frequency of certain diseases in different populations, so there must be something biological about this. Now, it turns out that this is a complex response. Uh, let, let me take sickle cell anemia to show you what I, I think is an issue. 
Sickle cell anemia actually occurs mainly among blacks who were migrating from the western part of Africa. Sickle cell anemia is not very common in East, East Africa. Sickle cell anemia is also uh, in a place called Okeminos in Greece. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's in other parts of the world. But because in the United States, it's mainly African Americans, scientists who work only in the United States could claim and began writing about this as a racial disease. And the literature is full for a period of about 10 years, post Human Genome Project, in which scientists were talking about sickle cell as if it were, quote, an African disease. Now, they, they didn't know anthropology. They, they didn't know geography or history. They were molecular geneticists. And though they, they assumed that because their, their purview was only in the United States, that this problem was, quote, a racial problem. Um, I could go on with other examples. Um, in Southeast Asia, there are certain kinds of diseases, but if you look uh, a certain kind of blood dyscrasias, which, which happens among certain Asians, but it happens across much of Asia. And in the early years, scientists there began to think of this in terms of the racialization of different groups and, and different vulnerabilities to, to these diseases. So again, um, let, let me come up to the present. Um, you can't turn on your TV these days and not come across something called ancestry testing. That's right. Yeah. And here's the problem with ancestry testing. It, it presumes that once we have your DNA, we can look at something called ancestry informative markers. And these markers are more likely to occur, let's say, in group A, B, or C. All right, the problem with this methodology is that all of these tests are done privately and proprietarily. And the owners of this technology are not in the public realm. That is, they're not sharing their databases with others. And that's the sine qua non. I mean, that, 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 that is the basic rule of science, that you need replication across right. different populations. Well, if Ancestry.com only has its own set of databases and don't, they don't share it with other groups, how can you say that they're right or wrong? You can't. Yeah. Yet people send, send their DNA into these companies and they come back with things like, well, you're 65% European, 18% uh, uh, you're, you're Asian, and so forth. And the first thing you have to come to terms with is a basic rule of statistics. Once you say something is 65% of something else, you must have a notion of 100%. Yeah. Once you say someone is 65% European, you must have a concept of 100% European. And, and you must know what that population is because the and derivative it, sample exactly. only has meaning in the context of the larger right. known population. And there is no way, there has never been 100% pure anything, European, African, Asian, no such thing. And yet these companies use these markers, which are proprietary. They have no basis for replication across the scientific community. And so there's no, essentially there's no peer review. I mean, this is pseudo science, it right? Is. There, there is no peer review. There's not even a sharing of the databases. So we don't know from one group to the next how and why they conclude one is, quote, well, 10% Asian. There's just, no collaboration yeah. possible. It seems to me that it has a lot of psychological commonalities with palm reading and horoscopes and things like that, in which, you know, you provide data, but everyone projects their own meaning onto that. Yes. And a lot of people, you know, they're searching for validity or somehow they're, they're searching for some resolution to an issue they have within their family history. Um, it, it's, there's a game-like quality to it as well to see how many degrees of separation, like, I don't know, George well, W. Bush is it, from it's Barack game -like. Obama. It may be game-like, but it's also serious business. My colleague, yeah. Aaron Panofsky, and his, his co-author have done research on this, and they've mm -hmm. shown that a lot of white supremacists are taking these, t these tests that's, that's to right. try to demonstrate that they are, quote, 100% quote, white. And when they get back, 
uh, often detailed quote percentages, which again uh, are, are not nonsensical, but which, but which they're quote shown that they're quote eight percent African ancestry. Um, they of course reject the test; they dismiss it as wrong, or sometimes they go into an existential crisis. <laughs> but they're looking for a scientific validity for the racist beliefs. Yes, that's what they're looking for. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, similar kinds of issues have come up in race science with intelligence testing. Of course, you know the work of Stephen Jay Gould. Yes, of course. And um, I'll share a couple of slides here, maybe provide a basis for us to talk about that. Um, Stephen Jay Gould was an eminent paleontologist and evolutionary theorist at Harvard. And in his book called The Mismeasure of Man, he writes about scientific racism in the late uh, 19th century among some of the leading scientists of that day in which they were looking to try to establish biological differences between the races uh, to reinforce the notion of racial hierarchy and superiority. There was a movement towards trying to measure a person's intelligence simply by looking at the size of their cranial capacity. It's called craniometry. They're measuring skulls. And one of the, I think, takeaways that you get from his book, The Mismeasure of Man, is just the extent to which there were unconscious biases that were driving this research. And I don't know if people would have even had a coherent notion of what it means to be racist at that, in that era. But in retrospect, we look at this as just being wincingly, unambiguously racist. Well, you know, you come to an uh, interesting point here. The whole, whole idea that at the individual level, one can be characterized as being a racist or not, has been a strong feature of the American experience for the last, oh, at least 50, 70 years. People have described themselves as not being racist or characterizing others as being racist. And that's at the individual level. Um, and, you know, as I have said in other contexts, um, it was a way of excusing one's own behavior. So I use the example of uh, the owner of a restaurant in the 1950s who would say, well, I'm not a racist, but if I invite or let black people come to my restaurant, other whites won't come and I'll lose revenue. So even though I'm not a racist, um, I just can't tolerate the possibility of losing money. Now, I gave the example of my own attempt to get an apartment where the, the owner of the apartment said, no, I rather would like to have you as a tenant, but other, other tenants and my family um, wouldn't. And so the idea that racism mm -hmm. can be understood at the individual level is to obscure what's going on in terms of what we now call systemic racism. That's right. It's a morality yeah. play and the way in which it's being framed. Because the argument essentially is that if a person doesn't have malicious intent and hostility or, you know, sin in their heart, then therefore they're not racist, irrespective yeah. of what their actions are. Right. So I, th I think this is one of the meaningful distinctions between, you know, the kind of psychological theories of a person like Theodore Adorno that found racism in a personality structure of authoritarianism and sociologists who say, okay, obviously attitudes matter. But what really matters is where the rubber meets the roads is in social policy and the way people are treated by other people. So even if a person says, hey, you know, I hate to do this and it's not me, the fact that they're discriminating against a person, you know, that has an effect upon people's quality of life. And I think this is a, a really important, an important discussion. And it has to do with what's happened in the last six months. Mm -hmm. That is this, what I've called the shift in the way in which news commentators, anchors on the evening news, reporters, uh, comedians, uh, late night show hosts, they've begun to talk about race and racism in new ways. After right. the George Floyd murder, I began to hear for the first time in the public arena, the routinization of the idea of systemic racism. So people, of course, will ask you, um, well, what do you mean? What is systemic racism? What is structural racism? That seems like an abstract term. And um, 
you know, Bill Clinton tried to have this conversation about race in America, and it didn't go anywhere. Uh, he, had, he had a commission that went around the country trying to have a conversation. Well, in the last six months, I think we've begun to have that conversation. And I, mm -hmm. I do have a couple of slides I want to show, which sure. pinpoint what I think is meant by systemic racism. And people will, will get a real sense of why this might be a different shift in the nation's conversation. Okay, 1939, Federal Housing Authority underwrites housing loans. And in those explicit determinations of who gets a loan, they say that race is the single most important criterion. And here's a passage from the FHA manual. It needs to be the case that the continued occupation are occupied by the same social racial classes. Okay, so here we have a federal housing manual. And here's the language. Real estate boards not only bar members from selling houses across the divide, but they went further. They put teeth into the code. 1943, Fundamentals of Real Estate Practice. It said that if you used your, your license to permit blacks to enter into a white neighborhood, you could lose your license. So it wasn't just that Again, you personally were not a racist as a real estate licensor, but if you chose to violate this code and rent across the racial lines, you could lose your license. That's called systemic. So for the next 30 years, whites got these housing loans, three to five percent while blacks were denied those loans. Here in Northern California, in that same period, that 25 year period, or actually 15 year period, that's how many homes were built, 350,000. Less than 100 went to blacks. This would be true for the whole country. Uh, Charles Abrams book documents this. 11 million homes were built in the U.S. with federal assistance. And in all cases, they had to deal with this problem of not, quote, interrupting the racial integrity of a neighborhood. This happens to coincide with the median net worth of white households, which is based, uh, the median net worth, by the way, its basic feature its basic element, its undercurrent, is whether you own housing or not. These are current figures, and they are directly related to the systemic pattern of housing loans that I just showed you. So the net, net worth of white households in this country, 10 times greater than among blacks. And just to give you, why this is not just from the 19th and 20th century. This is from the last seven to eight years. My hometown of Chicago, 170,000 loans approximately, totaling $57 billion, condominium, single family, and so forth. And between 2012 and, 2012 and 2018, 168,000 loans, 57 billion. 70% of those loans went to white neighborhoods, only 8% to black neighborhoods. In other words, banks loaned 40 billion to Chicago's white neighborhoods, 4 billion, and that's in the last decade. So here's the systemic feature of racism and housing. $40 billion goes to whites, 
living in the same proportion of the population in Chicago as blacks now. 4.6 billion to blacks. That's contemporary. This is not this is not the 19th century. This is not the 20th century. This is the last 10 years. 10 times more money went to whites in Chicago with loans for housing than to blacks. Wow. So what's the rationale and justification for that? Redlining. The idea was, as you saw in the 1939 housing loan, that you, 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 if you integrate, and here's what Donald Trump was saying just the two weeks ago, right. if, you, if you integrate the suburb, you integrate the white area, uh, property values will, quote, go down. And of mm -hmm. course, that's orchestrated by all kinds of forces and sources. There's no one answer to that question, but um, that was historically the case because of the way in which we had this apartheid system. Yeah, the, 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 they're actually this book I mentioned at the very beginning, all American Apartheid, and it's all about housing. It's all about housing. I think David Freund also has a book called Colored People's Property about this. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates in the Atlantic wrote an essay called The Housing Policies That Built Ferguson. Yes, redlining was what um, was the manifestation of what I showed you in that first two slides, namely, an area of Chicago, which was um, all black. Remember, I, I went to a high school that was 99.9% .9 black. Mm -hmm. That's because the whole area was black. And in Chicago, one of the most segregated cities in the country, you could draw a red line around where blacks lived. Yeah. And this is in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yes. Yeah. And if you lived inside of one of those lines, you could not get a loan to move outside. That was redlining. What I find interesting about the debate on redlining is that activists and various groups who've brought claims against this, protested, have taken on these banks for these discriminatory practices. And as is the case with many issues related to race and racism, the bankers deny that this has anything to do with race. They say the calculus is an economic one and that if if a person's living in a low-income community, if they're designated as being in lower socioeconomic status, that it's a poor investment, and therefore, you know, it's just a draconian economic calculus. I, I don't, yeah. I buy that as more of a justification for the policy right. rather than an explanation. So as you note, in the mass media, there has been the discussion that using these labels of systemic racism, structural racism, institutionalized discrimination, seems that this is coalesced around the Black Lives Matter movement protest. And from my vantage point, it seems that terms and theories and ways of talking about things that have been in our field in sociology for practically a generation are now making their way into a public discourse in the mass media. Um, what do you account for that? Is this, um, as educators, are we finally having an influence on the way people frame these issues? Or is, is it just some sort of cultural cachet of the way you talk about issues? I think several things are happening simultaneously. Uh, first of all, I do think that 25, 30, 35 years of teaching in anthropology, sociology, um, cultural studies has influenced a good part of the population. So a lot of the students who were students back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in classes in sociology of race are now in positions where they understand this language of systemic racism. Right. So that's one feature. But the other feature that I think is important is the way in which the media have been able to portray the responses of the police that indicate that there's not simply an individual response here, but a patterned response. In particular, the ways in which medical examiners who are aligned with the police have in the last year come up with accounts of what people saw with their own eyes and denied it. Right. I use the, 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 the George Floyd situation was dramatic because everyone saw that eight minutes, 46 seconds. The medical examiner's first response was, it was not asphyxiation, he had an underlying condition. Well, it turns out that there was a, a case in Los Angeles very recently, 
uh, right, right around the time of the, the Floyd situation, mm -hmm. where a Latino also had a similar circumstance of asphyxiation on camera. Medical examiners said, no, no, underlying condition. And so people began to say to themselves, wait a minute, I saw with my own eyes asphyxiation. <laughs> But what, what I think is important here is, is that the structural or systematic feature of racism is not just being seen in policing and housing, but the pandemic. So in the United States, we've had this dramatic development where the proportion of the population that's Latino and Black has been much more affected by the pandemic than the white population. And so the question, of course, is why? And because so many Blacks and Latinos are at the bottom of the economic social structure and are without insurance, medical insurance, mm -hmm. uh, or in jobs which require them to be out in the public as opposed to home sheltering in place. Mm -hmm. I think because of that conflation of circumstances, both the patterns in which the police, medical examiners, said things which were against our own understanding, our own looking at things. And then you add that to what we've just, what I just was described, people began to say, no, no, th this is not just racist behavior. This is not just rogue cops or a bad decision by one or two people. This is deeply immersed in the system of medicine uh, access to housing, access to medical care, and so forth. Yeah, I think it's not only the systematic oppression and the fact that we keep seeing these horrific encounters between the police and people that they're abusing or even murdering, but it's also become a kind of systematic denial that follows very pattern responses of downplaying it. You know, go all the way back to the Rodney King beating where a group of Los Angeles policemen descended on him and just beat him brutally, and they all walked on it because the justification was that that was standard police practice. And that's similar kind of arguments that are being made even with the George Floyd murder, that this is, this is the way the policing is, um, is trained. So there has to be something in the police reform of the way police is training. But um, it doesn't help that we have a president who enables this and himself is making these kind of arguments. And uh, I think putting the wind in the sails of a racist discourse on how we would understand what's right before our eyes. There's that famous statement first made by, I think, um, Groucho Marx, who's um, in a compromising situation, and his wife comes and catches him with another woman, and he says, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, you know? Right, and that captures it. <laughs> yeah. And so this kind of gaslighting in which it's, it's so readily obvious. Yeah. It could not be more obvious, and yet it's denied what we're seeing, this, this world of alternate facts that we're living in. Well, I think it's probably useful to comment here on the connection between substance um, and, shall we call it, uh, symbols. Because there's a lot of symbolic change happening right now. Mm. So, whether it's the Washington Redskins changing their name, whether the Confederate flag no longer flies at, um, at these um, military bases. Mil oh. Yeah, and so forth. Uh, whether statues come down. Uh, now, I don't mean to trivialize symbolic and cultural symbols. I think they're important. But I think there's always a danger that these symbols become what? surrogates for change. And so once the symbols come down, mm. once a Aunt Jemima changes her name to Aunt Jane, what has changed? And let me just give you a couple of examples from the world of sports. Um, you know, people taking a knee, beginning with Colin, Colin Ka Kaepernick a few years ago, produced this outrage. Mm -hmm. Well, now the National Football League has said, okay, okay, you can take, you can take a knee. Um, all right, can take a knee. However, there are 32 teams in the National Football League. Only two of them have black general managers. Right. Um, 
National Basketball Association, you know, again, both leagues, mainly now 60, 70, 80% African American, depending upon the team of, of the, you know, of the city. Um, and many of these players are making several million dollars. So on the surface, people will say things like, well, what, what are they taking? What, what are they doing? I mean, they, these are millionaires. Um, but it turns out that this is only a very small part of their careers. At most, sometimes three, four, five years, there's an mm -hmm. injury or there's some mm -hmm. issue and they can't mm -hmm. play anymore. Um, meanwhile, the owners are billionaires. <laughs> right. Um, so I think what's happened here is that, yes, symbolic change, substantive change can be placed side by side, but we have to be careful not to substitute and say, all right, now that they've changed their name, um, right. we've handled the major problem. Policing. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned the idea that the police have this capacity now to shoot, to kill, and there's something called qualified immunity. I won't get into the details of what's behind it, except to say this is a relatively new development. Qualified immunity comes into being only in about the 1970s, early 1980s, when the Supreme Court rules against itself. The original qualified immunity goes back to the Ku Klux Klan in about 1879, somewhere in there, there's a, a, a ruling. It's during Reconstruction, which says that it's okay for citizens to sue uh, public officials if they've been abused, maligned, and so forth. Um, it, it was, in other words, intended for good, good purposes. And in its earliest rulings in the 1960s, 1970s, it was actually used to help people sue the police. But the Supreme Court changed that all around beginning about 1978, 79, and in two successive rulings, the Supreme Court created qualified immunity as a concept which said the police, if they're acting in a rational way that ordinary people would say they understand this person was feeling threatened, then they cannot be sued. Now, well, there's so many better. questions that are begged there. What's ordinary? Exactly what, right. You know, how would a a uh, regular citizen interpret this, it's, yeah. it's clearly inherently biased. So, okay, so now we have qualified immunity as an issue in the country, and the Congress, the, Dem the Democratic House of Representatives, has now voted to end qualified immunity, but the Senate Republicans have refused to address it, so that's where we are. Do you think that the recent Black Lives Matter protest movement has brought a lasting change? I mean, it seems an argument can be made that this really is a paradigm shift in American race relations. Um, I'm a little pessimistic given the fact that a person like Donald Trump and his racial animosity is supported by still 40% of the American electorate. But there seem to be conversations that are taking place and media coverage in a tone that we didn't see previously. And you do have the taking down of all of these statues of the iconic figures of the Confederacy, uh, it would seem that that is a lasting change. A lasting change, but it's not structural. It's not systemic. Right, right. I think that, that is the important takeaway. It's a and symbolic move. It's a cosmetic move that doesn't really get to the underlying structure of inequality. And again, I don't mean to trivialize or minimize cultural symbols. I think they're important. Um, but oh. we can't let that get in the way of understanding what actually constitutes systemic housing practices, systemic policing practices, systemic practices within the medical field about how one uh, can or cannot treat a particular person because of their being mm -hmm. insured or not. So I don't want to say I'm pessimistic. I just think that we need to be very alert to keep our eyes on the ideas of systemic change and not simply say because we have name changes, we have done something that's really significant. Well, maybe an optimistic way of looking at it is that by invoking these terms and using this language, we're looking through a lens in a way that we had not previously. 
Okay, so that gives you a vantage point or, or a way of understanding yes. or kind of framing the issue, but then you have to act on that and the social policies have to change. Just because you recognize a problem doesn't mean that that problem has been effectively addressed. And that takes a lot more time. That's the issue of institutional racism that, you know, in the 70s, when you look at the public opinion surveys, people seem to be more accepting and maybe less racist than they clearly were just some years ago. But then institutional structures are deeply rooted and very resistant to change. Well, let, let me go back to where I began to sort of highlight this whole idea about systemic uh, and substantive. As I said, when, when I was a kid, um, certain parts of town you just couldn't go to. You couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't go to a bowling alley. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's how deeply mired we were in this apartheid system of structural racism and access to public accommodations. That changed dramatically. And within 20, 30 years, all over the country, including the Deep South, um, blacks could go to hotels, public accommodations of all sorts were open. Now that's real change. That's not just symbolic change, that's real change. Um, now when it comes to our current circumstance, housing, policing, the, um, access to me medicine, me Medicare, that's far more fundamental. And so I think we're going to run into real powerful backlog, backlash, um, systemic responses from people who don't want any change. And you can hear it, as you just indicated, and in the rhetoric of Donald Trump. So the idea that one would want to change housing policies so that low-income people could live in the suburbs, that's, a, that's not just a dog whistle, that's a bullhorn. That's all about white supremacy and racism, 1950s style. That's even before the civil rights movement, the way Trump is talking. So I think, again, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm pessimistic. I just think that the systemic features around policing and our housing are so deeply mired into the culture that we're going to have to have a huge reckoning in the next short period around these two issues. I think I'd be remiss if we didn't discuss for a little while this upcoming election. This recording is being made in the middle of September, and we have an election some 50 days away. Um, you know, the, the racial dynamics of electoral politics now are something that I've never really seen in my lifetime. Certainly you have, um, given your experience in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote an influential essay in The Atlantic uh, called the first white president, in which he made the argument that, although of course we've had Caucasian presidents uh, previously, uh, all of them virtually, F Trump was the first one who really built his campaign on white racial identity politics and set himself up in opposition first through the, the birther movement um, towards Obama, and then later just uh, finding any occasion to criticize Obama. And so, you know, perhaps we don't get Trump without Obama because it's it's a kind of reactionary movement in response to um, what Obama was provoking. So what is your view of the racial politics of this election and where are we going with this? Well, on the Tanahisi Coates position, um, I take a different view. Uh, it's true that Trump was using rhetoric around racial differences um, as a basis of his campaign. But that's one particular feature of, quote, white presidency, that is the campaign itself. I'm interested as well in the actual practices of a president. And in that sense, I don't think Coates is correct. I think Woodrow Wilson, for example, uh, did a lot to what should we say, um, backlash. And as he, the, the post office during Woodrow Wilson's tenure was being integrated. Um, he gets into office and completely goes back to segregation of the, of, uh, the, the post office. Um, so that's among many other things that, Wilson, that Woodrow Wilson did. So in that sense, 
I don't think Coates is right to emphasize the campaign as why this is the first white president. I look at the policies of the presidency to talk about whether or not they're, quote, indicating white supremacist policies. And I think Wilson was clearly in that category. Well, in the immigration policy that you see with Trump and his, uh, the architect of that, Stephen Miller, I mean, that seems to me to be really overtly and belligerously racist. That's white supremacist, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying that Trump is not. I just was saying that by saying he was the white, first white president, that may gloss over some important policy piece, uh, activities, uh, positions, and really long-term consequences um, that I think need, need to be addressed. I mean, Truman, after all, uh, integrated the armed services. Um, what, what do we make of that? Well, he didn't do more. Um, and of oh. course, it took uh, Eisenhower and Little Rock to begin the actual effective integration of the schools in the, in the South. Uh, but 50 years went by, right? And uh, we still haven't integrated. There, there are some indications, for example, that mm -hmm. uh, the country is as segregated in terms of schooling as it was 75 years ago. And we see that in COVID as well, where poor communities and, you know, the overlap, the intersectionality with uh, minorities as well has led right. to like, you know, public schools in Philadelphia shutting down because so many impoverished students don't have access to the technology right. um, that would allow them to do online learning. Yeah, I, I think we're in such uncharted territory in the next 60 days. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that we're going to see more and more revelations in the next 30 days. M more and more people will take the stage yeah. uh, to make statements about what they think are at issue with Trump's presidency. So I, I think it would be foolish to try to predict the October surprise. I think, I think it's, it's coming. The October surprise is going to be a vaccine and whether or not that vaccine is actually effective and accepted yeah. or not. And we won't know that for another you know, a few months. Even if, a, even yeah. if a vaccine is approved, you won't know its efficacy yeah. uh, for periods of time, you know, at least 60, 80 days. Yeah. I heard a very interesting discussion by Robert Gallo. He was the co-discoverer of HIV, mm. you know, the virus that leads yeah. to acquired immunodeficiency or AIDS. And his work was really groundbreaking because he conceived of the underlying structure of the virus in ways that people had not at the time. And he's rather sanguine about the whole notion of having a, a vaccine anytime soon. One point he said is that right now we think that having a vaccine, the ones that they've tested, might confer immunity for three to five months. But he said that's because they've only been testing them for three to five months. And that at the end of the day, they're not going to know for three years. And um, another point that he makes is that for 25 years, they've been saying that there's an, an HIV AIDS vaccine uh, months away and, and we still don't have it. So we may be putting a lot of false hope in yes. uh, a vaccine being an, an all-encompassing cure. Um, what I'm wondering if there's a vaccine to our current political moment, which <laughs> seems to be, uh, am I over-exaggerating to say that if, if this is a contested election in which Trump refuses to leave, it goes into the courts, and then due to voter suppression and gerrymandering and the Electoral College, even if Biden were to win, as, you know, under one argument Hillary did by, you know, winning three million more of the popular votes, same way with Al Gore versus uh, George Bush. And is it possible that um, some version of a civil war could break out around this? Civil war may be too strong, but... Uh civil unrest at a level that we haven't seen since the 60s, I think, is almost predictable. That is, yeah. the passions yeah. on both sides are so high yeah. that if Biden narrowly wins, uh, there will be civil unrest. He has to win by a considerable margin. Uh, and even then, I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't say the civil unrest is not likely. If we take the long view, is this to the overall benefit of American race relations that, that we're having these difficult conversations that, you know, it's not laying there dormant, 
as an issue that's unaddressed. It's being addressed. It's being fought over. There are strident arguments being made, you know, as they said during the Civil War, that it divides family against family. But there are conversations that are happening now that weren't happening uh, a decade ago. So in the long sweep of history, is, is this how we get to fundamental change? I think if you take long to mean long, <laughs> yes. That is, I, I think what's happening here is that generationally we have a huge difference, uh, that young people are much more likely to take the view that our racial structural circumstances are in need of repair. Right, and, right. Uh, the older population is more likely to take the view that uh, over our dead bodies, and that's the way it's going to be. Quite literally. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, Troy, I've taken a lot of your time. I learned a lot from you from this, and um, I just feel very privileged to be able to talk with you. The backstory to this conversation is that my mentor, Magali Safadi Larson, who was the chair of my dissertation committee at Temple, um, had worked with you and was a colleague back in Berkeley in the 60s, and you've known each other for many, many years. Right, right. Um, so I just feel very fortunate to be able to, to learn from you and that you took the time to talk with us today. Well, I, thank you very much. Magali is among my favorite people, and I'm glad that you had the chance to spend some time uh, in, in her company. <laughs> Magali is something, force of nature. Right. Any friend of Magali is a friend of mine. And I'll be in touch by email. And uh, I'll look it's been forward a pleasure. to it's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, we'll sign off for now. This is Temple University of Japan's ICAST through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. If you'd like more information and to see our previous archive of events, look to the ICAS website. And also, we have an archive on YouTube with previous events. Thanks for joining us today.